Pastor, as we approach uh, this next season, and I, I felt so strongly that we are to be a people who accept the call for a diligent and aggressive pursuit of the Lord with all of our hearts. And I mentioned there were three things that were not rescinded during a pandemic, and that was, first of all, worshiping the Lord, ministering to the Lord. The second thing was ministering to one another. And the third thing was to minister to the world with evangelism and discipleship. I want to talk about community this morning. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to quote someone I had shared this once before. Are you praying this morning? Are you praying for me this morning? Yes. Please do. But shout it out if you are. It's okay. Yes. Because I know more than ever, Lord, it is not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of the Lord that anything is communicated that goes from our head to our heart. This is my cry this morning. Amen. Amen. Now, the reason I feel so strongly about this is that you can talk about being spirit filled and having the power of God on your life. But if it doesn't equal out into if it doesn't manifest in a renewed commitment to community as a people of God then it's nothing more than a shallow meeting. And we are not for some shallow experience. We are for a deep encounter with God yeah. that causes us to be so related to him and so related to people around us that the world will see that we are indeed the disciples of the Lord Jesus. Enri uh, Nguyen wrote this comment, and I quoted this a couple of weeks ago. Community has little to do with mutual compatibility. Similarities in educational background, psychology, or psychological makeup, or social status can bring us together, but they can never be the basis for a community. Community is grounded in God, who calls us together and not in the attractiveness of people to each other. Community, then, is obedience practiced together. The question is not simply, where does God lead me as an individual person who tries to do his will? More basic and more significant is this question, where does God lead us as a people? So, we know that the scriptures make it clear in Deuteronomy that we were to love the Lord with all of our heart. We were to talk of him night and day. When we sit down to eat, when we go for a walk, when we put our kids to bed, when we go to bed, that we, we keep the Lord centered in everything of our lives. In the early church, Acts 2, 46, as they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. There was a community, a koinonia happening. And as they were ministering to the Lord, coming together, praising God, the Lord was adding to the church as that was happening. By the way, I want to just check something. How many of you, when you first came to church, not necessarily here, but any place in your life, and you found people who were so uh, welcoming that they would come to you and say, listen, we're really glad you're here. Who are you? And they would offer to take you either to their home for dinner or to go out someplace. Did anybody have that experience in your life? I can remember as a little kid going to churches, even way back in the little four square church in Rapid City, that a couple there, I can still see Clifford Slining and his wife and some others invited us to dinner. And as little kids, you know, four little kids, little runts that we got to go to someone else's house and eat different kind of food. Yeah, chicken dinner. It was good. And I just remember how we felt so welcome. And I remember when we moved to California, my folks went to Bible college later on in life to become a pastor. My mom, who's here, 93 years of old, has been a pastor and a Bible teacher and a prayer warrior. And so we went to this little church in Glendale. And, and when we walked through the door, you know, any, any pastor who sees a husband and wife and four kids knows you better get a hold of them. Your attendance is going up. You guys are all too serious. Help me now. Yeah. But I just remember they took us under their wing and us kids right away. We got involved in the youth group. I had never seen a burrito in my life before. And they went out to Taco Bell. That was my first introduction to something like Mexican food. And I just remember feeling so welcomed and so apart. And even though I didn't know what to do with the burrito when I got it, I was just glad to be about with a bunch of kids. It was such a neat thing about being together and and, you know, that we've lost some of that. 
We've lost some of that. We, we live in gated communities. We have a, kind of a boundary as to where we're going to get involved with people. In the early church, spirit-filled church had time for people, not only in the temple, but house to house, eating their bread with singleness of heart and gladness. They ministered to one another. In fact, this is one of the points I want to make this morning is Acts 2, 44 says, and all that believed were together. And what we're dealing with in this present hour is an exact opposite of what God's word has told us to do. He says, be together. And the spirit of fear, listen, I know, don't bug me, folks. I know there's some reality to what's going on. I don't, I'm not unsympathetic or uncompassionate toward those who've gotten sick. Don't get, don't get weird and religious on me. But I'm just telling you, when Jesus says, forsake not the assembly, there's a reason that he wants us to be together. Amen. And when we're not together, it begins to weigh heavily. Dr. Mark Sharona said that right now, in the ages of 25 to 75, in that block of people during this pandemic season, there's been record numbers of mental breakdown, emotional breakdown, where people are absolutely being crushed by being outside of the touch of human beings, to be in fellowship with one another. Folks, these things ought not to be, and I haven't even got started yet, folks. All that believed were together and had all things in common. That's the word koinonia in the Greek. That they, they, everyone shared. If one person shared, everyone shared. With great power, the apostles and disciples gave a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And I love this. This is out of uh, chapter 4. It says, neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and, and gave them to the apostles so they could distribute it to those that had need. Wouldn't that, be an inter- wouldn't that be an interesting thing that the body of Christ would so be alive in what they're called to be that there was no lack among the body? And then finally, because they were a worshiping people, Praising God, they had favor. Folks, uh, listen, when, when I was, was listening to your praise and worship this morning, I thought this is one of the witnesses to the nations when the people of God rejoice together with passion and fervency. You know, the world can do all kinds of stuff out there. They can, they, they can have their, their flash pots and their, you know, uh, fog machines and skinny jeans and all that stuff. And... And they can do strange stuff, but if the church gets excited about Jesus, somehow there's something wrong with them. Listen, it's time for the church to have something right with them where they praise God because he's real and he wants his people to enter into the fullness of joy. Oh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And this is where I'll I'll get into this later next week, hopefully, that that. We, we are anointed with that same Holy Spirit to go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God is with him. And I want to ask you something. Do you understand? Do you believe that God is with us? He is with us. But why is it so hard to find a healthy, vibrant Christian community? Why is committing to a church so rare in our culture? And I can list a billion things. You know, Right now, every time you turn the page, someone is blasting some religious leader who had a monumental failure. And I preached about this a couple weeks ago. You know, the church should deal with its own dirty laundry in its own doors. Instead of splattering it all over the community and causing people to stumble because they heard of some great leader that had some horrible flaws in their character. I want to remind you of something. This word of God confirms him, not me. And that's why, by the way, that I have a church council That's why I have elders in this church and men that I talk to, pastors who I relate to on every level. If there's something going on in my life, they know about it because I don't want to be one of those that ends up falling by the way because I thought I was big enough on my own to live without accountability. (sighs) I think I hurt myself on that last thing. (laughs) Folks, 
This is a time for us to realize how important God in his divine plan has prepared a way for us to stay out of the devil's mess and keep our testimony clear. Listen, don't throw away those who had a great influence because you found out they had flaws. Certainly the flaws are inexcusable, but they are forgivable before the blood of Jesus. But I'm hurt over some of the fact that young people, and myself included, even though I'm not young, have been greatly blessed by some of those who've been brilliant in how they exegete Scripture and how they bring a a sound argument to why our faith is legitimate from not only the Word of God, but through thoughtful pursuit. And so the world says, we can't trust them. And then Christians who've been hurt have said, well, you know, we saw this flaming evangelist fall and we saw this. You know what what you don't see? is you never see when they're falling, you only see it when they hit. And so anybody can gather around a splattered body on the ground, some failure, and say, well, I wonder what happened to him. Well, he fell. He fell. We've got to look for those and help them before they fall. Isn't that true? But by the way, you know, one of the safety measures in these last days that God has built into his church is relationships and, and by the way, it's, it is a struggle sometimes to let down our guard. Some of us have grown up, like I say, we've been hurt enough times that we've said, you know, I'm really not going to get too close to so-and-so because you never know, they might stab you in the back. Well, let me just tell you what I've learned over the years. People you get real close to will stab you in the front. Right. So you just, have, you just have to deal with it. So notice notice some of the stages that we all face when we're learning how to get close to people. First of all, you know, you get to a new place, and and I've been through this. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that I visited some churches as a pastor when I had days off or I was on vacation because I never take vacation from church. For me, that's blasphemy. Folks, I want to be in the house of God and worship with his people. But I've gone to places where it just wasn't very friendly, and you kind of felt like you were an outsider. And you wanted to wear a sign that says, I'm a Christian, and I might even be a pastor. Like me. And no one did. We're so afraid of each other, we're like porcupines. We come together until we stick, and then we kind of creep away. Do not confess I'm a porcupine Christian. So we have this first initial gathering where we're excited at the beginning. And we're excited about new things, new people, new experiences. Gives us a good rush inside. Oh, this is great. Then we go through that period of time called the disillusionment. Over time, the glitter of the new community wears off and we start seeing the brokenness in those around us. (laughs) See how broken they are? Just hold that mirror a little closer and you'll see how broken we all are. You know, we are drawn more to people because of our likeness and brokenness than we are for the person who seems to be you know, have it all together. When I get around those kind of people that have it all together, I just kind of keep my distance because I know they know every rotten thing about me. (laughs) And then there's that period of adjustment where we have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to remember our own personal neediness and, and God's deep love and forgiveness that he's poured on us so that we could pour that out on others. And church people are a weird bunch. We just are. You know, I notice when we get get in a circle where there isn't a lot of religious people or people who have a walk with the Lord, we feel very much like they feel when they're around us. We feel kind of like, how do I fit into this conversation? Very, very, very few people are as, as spiritual as some of the people I hang out with when I go to the stock car races in Fort Morgan. Those are the deep spiritual ones because they understand what... Never mind, I was just... <clears throat> but being humble and thankful to the Lord along the way can help us get past our own disillusionment. I, I really thought this church was different. I really thought that was... The, yeah, you know what? And by the way, God does move us around. Just, just so you know, don't get all weird on me, you know. Sometimes the Lord says, I'm assigning you to a new place. 
and God's directing something that he's going to release in a new way. And so, but it's important for us to understand how important it is to make connections. The church is not just for our own needs and preferences, it's for God's glory. That the church is created and for the benefit of all of his people. It's here where we learn to leave behind our personal preferences in favor of needs of the people of God around us. In coming out of our individualistic, uh, I'm not speaking in tongues, so I'm going to try to get the interpretation. When we get out of our individual, uh, when we're not individuals anymore. (laughs) Porky Pig taught me how to get out of that one, you know. That's all, folks. Okay. I'm sorry about that, folks. We're too individualistic. I must practice more of my words. So we have to get past all this. I want you to turn over to a scripture you all know very well. Chapter 12 of Romans. And I want to just read a few verses. Do not be. This is chapter 2. Or chapter 12, rather, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think seriously, soberly, as God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. For as we have many members of, in one body, all the members do not have the same function. Verse 9, let us love then without hypocrisy, abhorring that which is evil and cling to that which is good and be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another and preferring to one another, not lagging in the diligence, but being fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope and patient in our tribulation, continually stead, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And distributing to the needs of the saints, being given to hospitality, blessing those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. And be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Wow. Repair no, repay no man evil for evil. And have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I think God's serious. That we want to pay close attention to the things that he's called us to. Let love be without hypocrisy. Be the real deal. You know, I hear people say, ah, but you know what? I did that once and I got hurt. I want to tell you the only place that you can go and not be hurt is in the atmosphere of hell. Because everything in that atmosphere is hateful and self-centered. There is no love there. But when you risk yourself in relationships and loving people, you will get hurt. It's just the nature of the (laughs) of the human being. (laughs) So what do you do? Say, well, it's hopeless? No. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, we bring something into that environment that God has put within us to bring help and wholeness. Paul said in Philippians, therefore, if there's any consolation or comfort in Christ, the comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind, and let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Let each of you look out, not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of your calling by which you were called so that with all lowliness, humility, with all gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 
There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Well, that's, how deep is that? Well, you don't get much deeper than the scripture itself. Till we all come, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature or perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body joined, get this, joined and knit together by that which every joint supplies according to the effectiveness of working by which every part does its share will cause the body to grow and edify itself because of love. You know, this is why there's a real issue these days when everybody decides to be an island to themselves. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says, Woe to the person when he's alone if he falls, for there's no one there to help him up. Yes. It says, how can, how can two walk together unless they agree? And, how, and this is another one that we can all relate to. If it's cold outside, you're better off getting warm when there's another body next to you. There's something about us being close together. God wants us to have the kind of... Listen, I know of something that I've learned over the years, and you have too. Don't act surprised when I tell you. That sometimes we, instead of sharing the truth in love, we love to share what's wrong with the other person and loving every minute of it, you know. I want to be accountable until you want to make me accountable. And I'll talk about that next week, Lord willing. But it takes a real humble person to recognize that someone loves you enough to say, um, I saw something that I think if you saw it, you would really not want that to be in your life. Help me, somebody. Yes. You know, <clears throat> I've told this story before. When my boys were little, and they would eat anything they would eat, a pancake, a peanut butter sandwich, they would never put the thing where it needs to belong. So I remember my, one of my first pastorates, my boys were really young, and little Tommy had a pancake with butter and syrup. And I was going to grab a cup of coffee before I went to the church, which was right next door, and so I sat down to have a cup of coffee. I didn't exactly feel very comfortable when I sat down, but then I was in a hurry. So you're already there, aren't you? I get over to the church, and a little girl who didn't know any better, goes, Pastor Tom, you have a pancake stuck to your... <laughs> what? <laughs> and in fact, I had sat on a pancake. <laughs> and the evidence was still there. <laughs> and thank God that that little girl had enough... She just, was, she just didn't care. What even, you have a pancake stuck. You know, it was... <laughs> Unfortunately, we are so sophisticated that we, you know, we don't want to tell, you know, we don't want to tell anybody you, you have some broccoli in your teeth. No, that, that would be easy. It's talking about the things that we might see in another that we know if they, if they saw it, they really would not want to, want, would not want that in their life. And there's times, folks, I've caught myself reacting to something when I should have responded. And especially when it has to do with dealing with people and conflict or, or situations that can challenge you because you just weren't quite ready for what happened. Well, I tell you what, it is a matter of humility. It's a matter of being humble before the Lord. And I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next few moments. I know you're dying to hear everything I have to say. But, uh, and I know you are. But I want to just give you some things that would be, hopefully make this practical. By the way, I owe a lot of these uh, thoughts to one of my mentors, John Tyson, who uh, I've found a great deal of encouragement and help in formulating the, the, the proper thought process and words uh, 
to, to con- convey what God has put in my heart. And, and I, I feel like um, that I need to acknowledge those that have affected my life. By the way, if you have mentors in your life, you should celebrate them because they make us better. And just because someone else was smarter than me on a subject doesn't mean that I'm not supposed to take advantage of what the Bible says, that faithful men commit to other faithful men who commit the same thing they learned from that guy to another guy. So quit worrying about how brilliant you are and that someone might accuse you of plagiarism. (laughs) Plagiarism. So let me say this quickly. There are four things that are building blocks for community. One is priority, our practices, our proximity, and our permanence. The priority that we have as people of God is, number one, to seek first the kingdom of God. Understanding that our identity as children of God and the family of God is connected as heavenly citizens. We are citizens of another kingdom. And therefore, we understand our priorities are different than the world. We don't get to cast someone aside because they offended us. Oh, there's so many scriptures I want to give you. If you want to jot them down, Philippians 3.20, Ephesians 5, 1 through 8. Just a lot of backup for what I'm saying. Understanding our relationship as a body with one another is important because chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians Verses 12 through 31 goes in depth about how we're interconnected, interrelated, dependent on one another. You know, I have found that if there is a weak point in a joint or something, uh, I have weak knees. And I know because of the years of hanging sheetrock and doing that stuff that I wore them out. It wasn't their fault. They just couldn't take all the lifting and all the weight that I was bearing down on them. So, but I tell you what. If those knees would have stayed a lot healthier than they are, I could, have, I could still run. I could still jump. And occasionally I do. And then I hurt for a day or two. Because everything, you know, everything in our bodies are connected. And so it's true in the body of Christ that you may think, I, I really don't have anything to offer anybody. But according to the Bible, we are interconnected by the Spirit, fitly joined together and compacted. That means the idea of compacted, that that verse has to do with a thatched roof. We're so connected that whenever any rain or storm comes, it helps keep out the elements. And so we are a covering for one another. We're protective of one another. And oh, folks, do we need protection these days? We need people around us that will encourage us and keep us focused on who we are as citizens of heaven. Amen. So we seek first the kingdom. And then Psalm 133 says, There is a place of commanded blessings where brethren in unity dwell. It is like the ointment that flowed off Aaron's beard, and it's like the dew of Hermon that descends upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing. There's something about being in unity. It doesn't mean that we all agree on everything. It simply means that our one focus about Jesus is the thing that keeps us bound together. That no matter, listen, there are people who have completely screwed up ideas of politics. (laughs) That's a loaded statement. But you know what? You also write this out there. I'm glad I didn't say that. I'm quoting you. No, here's the problem. What binds us together is not our our politics. In fact, what divides us more than anything is is the idiocy of of trying to choose a side instead of choosing righteousness. The kingdom is not left or right. It's up and down. Do we choose God? Do we choose his ways? Unity is a priority that we be unified because when we are, we know on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were all in one accord, one place. That's a miracle to get the body of Christ together in one place. And being a one accord. What was their one accord about? Seeking the Lord after what Jesus told them to do. Go back to Jerusalem and wait upon the promise of the Father. Because I'm going there and I'm going to send that promise of the Father. And you should wait until you be endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's our priority is to seek first the kingdom. Seek first the priority of understanding how God has knit us together. Second thing, the practice. And we know this out of Acts chapter 2, and, uh, 42 through 47, and Acts 4, 32 through 37. We worship together. We pray. Listen, these are the components of being together. 
Worshiping together, praying together, studying the word together, sharing meals together, <clears throat> confessing to one another, and generosity. What we talked about earlier that no one lacked anything because people generously gave. Now, I want to tell you something that's important here. The worship team uh, chose to, to uh, read a book together called The Reset by Jeremy Riddle. And as I've heard their testimonies back of how it's impacted their lives and how it's impacted even the way that they do their ministry work here for us. I don't know if you notice it. I've always noticed an anointing on them. But I've noticed an intensity of anointing as they have come to terms with even more the precise aspect of what worship is. It's not about the performance. It's not about the expertise of the musicians. It's about the, expert, the, the excellence of the heart and the focus that everything will be upon the one who deserves all the glory. Amen. And they've decided to use that as a context for communication and sharing together. These are the things that make us one. Now, the last thing, that's well, not the last thing, but it's going to be close. Um, the proximity. That's, that's kind of an interesting word, and I didn't like it, but I couldn't find one that fit better with all those Ps. <laughs> so what is it we're really trying to say? We're talking about the nearness and closeness in relationship. <sighs> Look at this. This is amazing to me. Thessalonians, and I'm going to quote a number of things from Paul's epistles. This is what he says about closeness. This is talking about how close you are to people, how close you get attached to people. By the way, I've only known this couple just a few short weeks, but as I sat with next to them in worship, I wanted to turn to Harold and Myrna and say, man, I'm glad you're here. I don't even know you that well, but I am so glad you're here. Yes. I like the fact that I can feel a connection with people around me and say, you know, we're in this thing together. Praise God. Just think what God's going to do as we move forward. And by the way, I feel that way about all you guys, all you critters out there. Oh, what a privilege it is to be united together. The younger people stepping in. Us other guys <laughs> who are still young at heart. <laughs> Our closeness, it's so important. Here's what Paul said. I loved you so much that I not only shared with you the gospel, but my very own life. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 12, 15, the apostle Paul said, I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. <laughs> Any pastors here have ever felt that? How about anybody who's serving at someone and you, you feel like the more you do, the less response you get back? Yeah, help us, Lord. Paul says in Romans, I long to visit with you so that I can impart some spiritual gift to the end that you'd be established. Romans 15, 29, I'm sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. I want to ask you, are we having a good, good blessed time together today? Yeah, we are. I like it. Romans 15, 32, then by the will of God, I will be able to come to you with a joyful heart and we will be encouraged to, uh, an encouragement rather, to each other. Oh, I love these words. I love these scriptures. Now, these are the ones that become very personal to me. And I was going to try to cut these short, but I can't. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're linked with someone in, in a project, in a ministry, when we first opened this building back in 2000. Uh, when we started remodeling, it was probably about 2003, I think, or 2004, we started doing all the remodeling here. Oh, by the way, we paid off our loan Woo! completely. So anyhow, that's a little side thing. But when we would get together with the guys, they came here after work, tired and beat. And they got on scaffold and they ran wire and they hooked up lights. And they, they, they gave up their time. And we grew closer during those times because we were in a project together. It was one of those things that, and by the way, is Sean going to be here? No, I don't know if he's going to be. Oh, there, he just got here. And how we rejoiced to realize that the people that we had been linked with and that we had really counted on actually decided to show up. It was wonderful. I'll spend my life serving you. This is what Paul said when he's on a missionary trip. He goes, when I came to the city of Troas to preach the goodness of Christ, the Lord had opened a door of opportunity for me. 
But I had no rest in my spirit because Titus hadn't yet re, uh, re, had not yet arrived. So I said goodbye and went to Macedonia. Later on, it says, when I arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest in my spirit again because we faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, but God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of of Titus. Second Corinthians 7, 13, we've been greatly encouraged by this. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was about the way you all welcomed him and set his mind at ease. Isn't that one? You know what that's, seriously, I could go through and look at every one of you but I said it this morning when I came up front and I saw Jesus was here, I, and he's had to, on assignment to take his wife to get the infusion, so he's not been able to be here in the last several weeks. So when I saw him, I said, are you here today? He said, I'm here. And I'll tell you what, I was comforted by that. Yeah. And I'm comforted by seeing you. Not, not because we want more people in the service. Help me, somebody. Really? You know, it's great to have, listen, it's, if you've ever been on this side, it's more fun to have a lot more people to yell at and have them yell back. <laughs> without a vision, people perish, and without a people, vision perishes. You know, I, I'm telling you, it's something about it's just getting together, and it's and I, I, believe me, this this pandemic has kind of cured me of the worry about attendance, because I know we're talking to people online and so on. But I want to tell you something. What it's encouraging to me is to see the, the, the growth of, of one another and the dependency we have on one another to be together and feel like, hey, we're still on point. We're on focus of what God has called us to do. So that proximity thing has to do with the fact that we need to grow so close to one another. And there's, I've got a ton more scriptures. I don't have time to give them all. But folks, we need to stay close and near to one another because this is where... We are encouraged and strengthened. Can I hear an amen, somebody? Amen. Now, the last thing, the very last thing before. Oh. <laughs> all, of, all of those people online, they're going, what is going on? We have one over here who doesn't need to be in- introduced. He needs to be explained. Okay. No. We need this closeness in relationships. But I want to tell you that one of the things that's so neat about the kingdom is that there is a permanence. A permanence. Not just, listen, I have a lot of good family members that come here. But you know the thing I, I so rejoice in is that I have relationships all over the country that I don't ha- know how to explain it other than it is a God thing. Yep. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. You just feel connected with this person. You may have different opinions about stuff, but when you're together, you don't even need to talk to each other because you just, I'm, I'm with my friend. And when you do talk, it's substantive. And if, you want, if, you, if it's not substantive, it's probably funny. Something that you just feel at ease with that person. And there's that permanence of saying, listen, I may be a thousand miles from my good friends in South Dakota, the Jensen brothers who I sang with for 10 years. And even though I haven't been with him for over a year, I always think of them, my dear friends. And I think about the God thing that he put together. And folks, I'm telling you, most of you in this room right now have that same place in my heart that God gave us a sense that it's a God thing that you're here. And if you move to First Church South of God next, next week, it wouldn't change who I am to you and what you are to me. Because there's a permanence in our life, in our lasting love and relationship, the bond of Christ that holds us together. And Jesus, knowing that his final hour had come, that he should depart of the world, having loved his own, he loved them until the very end. And then he washed their feet and he said, listen, I've given you this example that you should do as, to others as I've done to you. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. What is he saying? He's saying the bond is permanent. You might even have a, a time in your life where you had something so agreed this happened between you that you said, I just can't, I just need some distance from that person for a while. Well, get over it. Because I do know what that's like. I know, you know, some people get upset with me and they might say, you know, I don't care if I ever see them again, but I know they're lying. 
They can hardly wait to see my chubby face, you know. I want to tell you something, folks. We need each other. And community, you can boast all you want about our Pentecostal heritage. But if it doesn't come together around us, building up one another and the relationship we have as a family, then we really are talking a different story. Because God has joined us together in Christ. And it's important for us to keep that tight, close community. Amen? Amen. Stand with me and let's just seal it together. And I want to seal it by this way. But to say, Lord, we're in agreement that we are connected by the good grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And by the wonderful Holy Spirit by which we are made one. Could you declare that with me? And just in your own way, lift your hands and say, Lord, thank you that you've joined us together as the people of God. Oh, Lord, we come from so many different places, different ideas, different thoughts, but we are one in the love and bond of Christ. And Lord, we thank you that today you've linked us up. And Lord, somehow in our being together, it's increased the energy flow of the Spirit in and through us. Even if two or three are gathered, there the kingdom of God resides. And that all of heaven and earth pays attention when two or three are gathered together in your name. And what we ask will be done because there's power in agreement. And Lord, I thank you that we can be in agreement about you and about your kingdom and about what you want to do in these days. And so, Father, we say yes. We say yes. We say yes. Keep us together in the bond of peace and help us keep our focus always on who Jesus is and what he's called us to do and to be. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for being here. Be sure to hug neck, shake hands, don't get mixed up. Whatever you need to do, put a gunny sack over your head, but just love one another. All right, God bless you.